Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, today we are going live on Facebook for a very special event. Um, my name is Erin Creighton, and I am the Adult Services Department Head for the Porter Branch. I'm happy to be joined today by uh, Joanna, who works at the Porter Branch. We will who is a library assistant at the Porter Branch. Uh, we will later be joined by Ingrid, who is also a library assistant at the Porter Branch, who is a little bit stuck in traffic, but will be here shortly. Um, so why don't, uh, Joanna, why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit more about the um, African-American read-in, the National African-American read-in. All right, so it was created by the Black Caucus of the National Council of Teachers of English. The African-American read-in was designed to highlight uh, literacy during Black History Month. Uh, since its inception in 1990, the initiative has reached more than 6 million people all around the world. That's pretty impressive. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really great to make literacy a big part of anything, but <laughs> uh, especially history months like Black History, Women's History, all the, all the good history months. Um, so do you want so, to tell us a little bit about our presentation? Yes. Yeah, so we've got a great series of presentations for you today. Uh, the Stafford NAACP Youth Council members will be sharing original poems and stories, as well as reading some published favorites. We'll also have a presentation on wellness by local author Amanda Lynch and a presentation by the Virginia Department of Historic Resources on their Historic Marker Program. Uh, and then we'll finish with a musical presentation by Little Black Newt Studio. And I've watched that musical presentation. You guys totally need to stick around for the whole thing and watch that at the end because it is absolutely fantastic. Everything is fantastic, but um, I got a little teary-eyed when I listened to the music because I think there's power in music. I think it has a, really does have the power like words do to connect us all together. So on that note, we are going to go to a presentation by the Stafford NAACP Youth Council. And I'm just gonna give me one second here to share my screen, share their screen. And we're just going to click add. And all right. So here we go. Hello everyone, my name is Carolyn Reed. I'm a sophomore at Mountain View High School and the president of the Stafford NAACP Youth Council. So a little bit about what we do. Uh, as a part of the NAACP Youth and College Division, we work to educate and prompt discussion around issues affecting African Americans and other minorities, um, inspire an appreciation of the African diaspora and people of color's contribution to society, and then develop an intelligent and effective youth leadership. Uh, we are a group of highly passionate middle school, high school, and college students who are working to bring about change in our community. Um, one of the ways we do this is through volunteering. For example, this past Saturday, we distributed over 300 boxes of food to families in need. Uh, this winter, we organized a Toys for Tots drive, um, and pre-COVID, we repeatedly volunteered with the nonprofit organization known as SERVE. Uh, at our meetings, we host a variety of speakers to inform us on a multitude of issues that affect our community. Um, for example, Ms. Candy King, our newly elected delegate, will be speaking at our next meeting about the vital work of delegates and the importance of youth getting involved in the political process. Um, so if there are any youth under the age of 25 who would be interested in joining or have any questions, please email me. My contact information will be in the chat. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank Ms. Erin Creighton for allowing the Youth Council to be involved in this event. Um, so without further ado, I will start the reading today with a prose by Nikki Giovanni uh, called Rosa Parks. Um, some background information before I start. The prose refers to the um, Pullman Porters. For those unfamiliar, poor Pullman Porters were former slaves who, shortly after the Civil War, were hired to work on railroad trains as porters on sleeping cars. Um, while they were underpaid, overworked, and endured constant racism on the job, uh, the Pullman porters had a significant impact on history. Uh, they helped aid African Americans during the Great Migration by acting as covert intelligence network uh, for Black rail travelers who left the South in search of better opportunities. Um, and they organized the first African American labor union in 1925. So with that bit of history, this is the piece. This is for the Pullman porters who organized when people said they couldn't. 
and carried the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender to the Black Americans in the South so they would know that they were not alone. This is for the Pullman Porters who helped Thurgood Marshall go south and come back north to fight the fight that resulted in Brown v. Board of Education. Because even though Kansas is west, and even though Topeka is the birthplace of Gwendolyn Brooks, who wrote The Powerful, the Chicago Defender sends a man to Little Rock. It was the Pullman Porters who whispered to the traveling men, both the blues men and the race men, so that they would both know what was going on. This is for the Pullman Porters who smiled as if they were happy and laughed like they were tickled when some folks were around and who silently rejoiced in the 1954 when the Supreme Court announced its 9-0 decision that separate is inherently unequal. This is for the Pullman Porters who smiled and welcomed a 14-year-old boy onto their train in 1955. They noticed his slight limp that he tried to disguise with a doo-wop walk. They noticed his stutter and probably understood why his mother wanted him out of Chicago during the summer when school was out. 14-year-old boys with limps and stutters were apt to try to prove themselves in dangerous ways when mothers aren't around to look after them. So this is for the Pullman Porters who looked over that 14-year-old while the train rolled the reverse of the Blues Highway from Chicago to St. Louis to Memphis to Mississippi. This is for the men who kept him safe. And if Emmett Till had been able to stay on a train all summer, he would have maybe, maybe grown a bit of a paunch, certainly lost his hair, probably have worn his bifocals and bounced his grandchildren on his knee, telling them about his summer riding the rails. But he had to get off the train and ended up in Money, Mississippi, and was horribly, brutally, inexcusably and unacceptably murdered. This is for the, for the Pullman Porters who, when the sheriff was trying to get the body secretly buried, got Emmett's body on the northbound train, got his body home to Chicago, where his mother said, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. And this is for all the mothers who cried. And this is for all the people who said never again. And this is about Rosa Parks, whose feet were not so tired. It had been, after all, an ordinary day until the bus driver gave her the opportunity to make history. This is about Rosa Parks from Tuskegee, Alabama, who was the field secretary of the NAACP. This is about the moment Rosa Parks shouldered her cross, put her worldly goods aside and was willing to sacrifice her life so that the young man in Money, Mississippi, who had been so well protected by the Pullman Porters, would have not died in vain. When Mrs. Parks said no, a passionate movement was begun. No longer would there be a reliance on the law. There was a higher law. When Mrs. Parks brought that light of hers to expose the evil of the system, the sun came and rested her shoulders, bringing the heat and the light of truth. Others would follow Mrs. Parks, Four young men in Greensboro, North Carolina would also say no. Great voices would be raised singing the praises of God and exhorting us to forgive those who trespass against us. But it was the Pullman Porters who safely got Emmett to his grand uncle. And it was Mrs. Rosa Parks who could not stand that death. And in not being able to stand it, she sat back down. Thank you. Hi, so tonight I'm going to be reading an excerpt from We Should All Be Feminists by a Nigerian author by the name of Timamande Ngozi Adichie. Not long ago, I walked into the lobby of one of the best Nigerian hotels, and a guard at the entrance stopped me and asked me annoying questions. What was the name and room number of the person I was visiting? Did I know this person? Could I prove that I was a hotel guest by showing my key card? Because the automatic assumption in Nigeria is that a Nigerian female walking into a hotel alone is a sex worker because a Nigerian female alone cannot possibly be a guest paying for her own room. A man who walks into the same hotel is not harassed. The assumption is that he is here for something legit legitimate. Why, by the way, do the hotels not focus on the demand for sex workers instead of the 
Obstantial Supply. In Lagos, I cannot go alone into many reputable clubs and bars. They just don't let you in if you're a woman alone. You must be accompanied by a man. And so I have male friends who are rubber clubs and end up going in with their arms linked with those of a complete stranger because of because that complete stranger, a woman out on her own, had no choice but to ask for help to get into the club. Each time I walk into a Nigerian restaurant with a man, the waiter greets the man and ignores me. The waiters are product of a society that has taught them that the men are more important than women. And I know they don't intend harm, but it is one thing to know something intellectually and quite another to feel it emotionally. Each time they ignore me, I feel invisible. I feel upset. I want to tell them that I am just as a just as human as the man, just as worthy of acknowledgement. These are little things, but sometimes it is the little things that sting the most. Not long ago, I wrote an article about being young and female in Lagos. An acquaintance told me that it was an angry article and I should not have made it so angry, but I was unapologetic. Of, co of course it was angry. Gender as it functions today is a grave injustice. I am angry. We should all be angry. Anger has a long history of bringing about positive change, but I am also hopeful because I believe deeply in the ability of humans to remake themselves for the better. But back to the anger, I heard the caution in the acquaintance tones, and I knew that the comments was as much as the article as it being about my character. Anger, the tone said, is particularly not good for a woman. If you're a woman, you're not supposed to express anger because it is threatening. I have a friend, an American friend, who took over a managerial position from a man. Her predecessor had been considered a tough go-getter. He was blunt and hard-charging and was particularly strict about the assignment of timesheets. She took on her new job and imagined herself equally tough, but perhaps a little kinder than him. He didn't always realize that people had family, she said, and she did. Only weeks into her new, into her new job, she disciplined an employee about a forgery on a timesheet, just as her predecessor would have done. The employee then complained to the top management about her style. She was aggressive and difficult to work with, the employee said. Other employees agreed. One said they expected that she would bring on a woman's touch to her job, but she hadn't. It hadn't occurred to any of them that she was doing the same thing for which a man had been praised. I have another friend, also an American friend, who has a high paying job in advertisement. She's one of those, she's one of two women in her team. Once at a meeting, she said she felt slighted by her boss, who had ignored her comments and praised something similar when it came from a man. She wanted to speak up to challenge her boss, but she had it. Instead, after the meeting, she went to the bathroom and cried, then called me to vent about it. She didn't want to speak up because she didn't want to seem aggressive. She let her, she let her resentment simmer. What struck me with her and many other females female American friends I have is how invested they are in being liked, how they have been raised to believe that they are, that being likable is very important and that this likable trait is a specific thing. And this specific thing does not include showing anger or being aggressive or disagreeing too loudly. We spend too much time teaching girls to worry about what boys think of them, but the reverse is not the case. We don't teach boys to care about being like. We spend too much time telling girls that they cannot be angry or aggressive or tough, which is bad enough, but then we turn around and, and either praise or or excuse men for the same reasons. All over the world, there are many magazine articles and books telling women what to do, how to be and not to be, in order to attract or please men. The, there are far fewer guides for men about pleasing women. I teach a writing workshop in Lagos, and one of the participants, a young woman, told me that a friend had told her not to listen to my feminist talk. Otherwise, she would absorb advice that would destroy her marriage. That is a threat, the destruction of marriage. The possibility of not having a marriage at all, that in our society is much more likely to be used against a woman than a man. Gender matters everywhere in the world, and I would like today to ask what we should begin to dream about and plan for a different world, a fairer world, a world of happier men and a happier women who are truer to themselves. And this is how to start. We must raise our daughters differently. We must also raise our sons differently. And that'll be all for tonight. Hello everyone. My name is Fatmato Sise. I'm a sophomore in Germana Community College, graduating this year, 2021, yes. Today, I am part of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, in regards to Black History Month, I'm going to be reading a book, a book called So Long a Letter.
Espanha Senegalês Waira Maria Maba. Dear Asiatu, I have received your letter. By way of reply, I am beginning this diary, my prop in my distress. Our long association has taught me the confiding in others' allies' pain. Your presence in my life is by no means fortuitous. Our grandmothers in their compounds were separated by a fence and would exchange messages daily. Our mothers used to argue over who would look after our uncles and aunties. As for us, we wore our wrappers and sandals on the same stony road to the Quranic school. We buried our milk teeth in the same holes and begged our fairy godmothers to restore them to us, more splendid than before. If over the years, and passing through the reality of life, dream dies. I still keep intact my memories, the salt of remembrance. I conjure you up, the past is reborn, along with this profession of emotions. I close my eyes, ebb and ties of feelings, heat and dazzlement, the wood fires, the sharp green mango beating in turns, a delicacy in our greedy mouth. I close my eyes, ebb and ties of images, drop of sweet beating your mother's orchard colored face as she emerges from the kitchen. The process of young, wet girls chatting on their way back from the springs. We walk the same path from adolescence to maturity, where the path begets the present. My friend, my friend, my friend. I call on you three times. Yesterday you were divorced. Today I am a widow. Wearing our rappers, don't even care about, <laughs> about whether they're dirty, they're torn apart. We just want to wear them together and, you know, feel free as a kid. So this book is really dear to me. So I'm just going to stop here for now. I am the black child. I'm special. Ridicule cannot sway me. I am strong. Obstacles cannot stop me. I hold my head high, proudly proclaiming my uniqueness. I hold my pace, continuing forward through adversity. I, I am proud of my culture and my heritage. I am confident that I can achieve every goal. I am becoming all I can be. I'm the black child. I'm a child of God by Michelle Williams. When I read, when I read this poem, it spoke to me to where I thought of the, the NAACP when I read this poem, and that's why I enjoy reading this poem, because I like it. My name is Jolene Duku, and for the African-American reading, I decided to choose this poem called You Call Me Colored. It's a poem that was written by an unknown source speaking about the segregation era. This poem reflects the usage of the term colored, which was used in a derogatory way of referring to Black people. This is the poem. When I was born, I was Black. When I grew up, I was Black. When I'm sick, I'm black. When I go out in the sun, cold, I'm black. And when I die, I'll be black. But you, when you're born, you're pink. When you grow up, you're white. When you're sick, you're green. When you go out in the sun, you go red. When you're cold, you go blue. And when you die, you'll be purple. And you have the nerve to call me colored. Why do you say this poem is referring to Black people and Caucasian people back in the 1900s during the segregation era? Um, I really like this poem because they use the term card in a der derogatory way, and the author is telling them, but if I'm colored, what does that make you? It just feels like really powerful to me, and like it's like you're saying something back to the people that oppressed you for many, many years. I wish I knew who the author was, but they chose to stay anonymous, and the poem has been reiterated many times. Um, but
but it's a really nice poem. And even though the poem is very short, um, I think I think it's really powerful and it makes me want to advocate more for Black people and all minorities' rights. It's a perfect poem, in my opinion, that sums up the entire segregation era, and I just think it brings light to the situation as well. That's for my that's my poem for the reading. Thanks for listening. Library. My name is Augustine Dupree. I'm the second vice president at the NAACP Council. Um, this is um, the second time I've actually done. Actually, no, this is the third time that I've done the reading. i uh, reading for um, library. I'm 17 years old. I go, I go to book one high school and such. You know, all the basic details. Are, um, yeah, so I, as I said before, I'm the second vice president of the NWCP Youth Council. And today I'm going to be reading The Cage Bird by uh, Maya Angelou. The Cage Bird is honestly one of the most impactful poems that I've actually that I've um, heard ever. Um, I'm not usually a poetry type of guy, but um, listening to this poem made me appreciate how much thought and effort goes into poetry. I actually read about um, I Know Why the Cage Bird saying this by Maya Angelou um, last year, and um, I got a detailed insight into her life and how um, she had to face all the struggles of um, being Black and um, being a, a Black girl living in um, a small town in Arkansas where um, the independent racism and such, all the battles that she had to face, not only with racism, but within her family as well. So then, yeah, um, this I chose out this poem because it reminds me of um, how much um, us as a community as Black people strive and try to reach towards um, freedom, but um, we have people wow. constantly trying to cage, um, quote unquote, cage us and stop us from reaching our true goals and aspirations. Just, um, you see, um, just a month ago, you see um, a bunch of rioters and insurrectionists trying to take away our what um, makes America great in, in a democracy. We have a person who's going to lie for us and try his hardest to um, support the Black community in the best way that he knows how. And we have a bunch of racist, um, white supremacists coming to to take away that freedom from us and trying to ignore our problems because they can't stand to see us as equals and such. So this poem, I chose this poem because it reminded me of um, the promise of a better tomorrow and the um, central idea of that. So um, without any further ado, this is um, inspired by Maya Angela. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and flows downstream to the end, to the current's end and dips his wing in the orange sun's ray and dares to climb this claim the sky but a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage his wings are clipped and his feet are tied so he opens his throat to sing the cage bird sings with fearful trill of unknown things of unknown but long for still and his tune is heard on a distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom the free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade winds south through the sight, sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. The cage bird stands on the ground of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with fearful trill of unknown, things unknown. But long for still, and his tune is heard, and the distant hill where the cage bird sings of freedom. Um, thank you for uh, listening in to my, um, my reading in about poem. I mean, once again, Maya Angelou, um, one of the greatest poets of all time, in my opinion. Um, and yeah, that was why the cage bird sings. Thank you.
My name's Cameron Sherrier, and today the expert I'll be reading from is, well, that I'll be reading is, um, excuse me, I Rise by Maya Angelou. I'm pretty sure some of you are familiar with that. So this is, well, it's the passage, or poem, I guess you could say. Does my sassiness upset you Why you are beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my own living room. It's like moons and suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, I will rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't take it awful hard. Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words and cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but just like air, I'll rise. Does my beauty upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of history, shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. In a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dreams and the hopes of the slave. I rise. I rise, I rise, I rise. Thank you. But why I chose that passage was because as a Black young woman growing up in America, or any Black woman in general, us saying or saying saying stuff back or expressing ourselves, feelings, stuff like that, we're often, the stereotype, society stereotypes us as the angry Black woman or quote unquote hood or ghetto and really that's not the case because we tend to like as i'm doing right now talk with our hands and show emotions when we talk and so in that passage it just like think that it like it like almost matched up with what i was trying to say almost so as i'm reading through i'm like yeah this is actually pretty good like this would be a really good matchup for the poem that I'm reading, so that's why I chose I Rise. I still, still I Rise, I'm sorry. Bye. Hello, everyone. My name is Fatmata Sise. I'm a sophomore in Jamana Community College. I have been part of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People for three years. In regards to Black History Month, I am going to be telling you guys a bit about why I always wear my African outfit. First, I was born and raised in Sierra Leone, West Africa. To me, the reason why I always wear my African outprint is that it connects me to my hometown. Being here means a long distance from home, but wearing my African outprint takes me back to all those memories that I've relived in Africa. It makes me to be connected to my people and my homeland. But I went online and I did a re little research about what the African outprint really meant. And it has a name, but it's an African outfit. The text I use to make African print is called Ankara fabric. That is also referred to as African wax print. The Ankara is known for its beautiful colors and it's deeply associated with African clothing. Oh, this my African hands then gonna love you. Hi everyone, my name is Primo Gross and I'm a first year student at the College of William & Mary. Today, in honor of Black History Month, I will be reading an excerpt from our Vice President's memoir titled, The Truth Behold, An American Journey. In this excerpt, our Vice President discusses the influential role of a special friend and colleague by the name of Venus Johnson. 
Happiness was part of the inspiration for a speech I often give, especially in front of groups of young women. I like to induct them into what I call the role models club. I tell them that whatever profession they choose, they've got to keep raising their hands to share and take credit for their good ideas and to know that they deserve to rise as high as they dare to climb. I also tell them that when they see others in need, they've got to go out of their way to lift them up. I tell them that sometimes members of the role models club can feel alone. Sometimes they may think, do I have to carry this burden by myself? The fact is, they will find themselves in rooms where no one else looks like them. Breaking barriers can be scary. When you break through a glass ceiling, you're going to get cut and it's going to hurt. It is not without pain, but I ask them to look around at one another and hold that image in their brains and their hearts and their souls. I tell them to remember that they are never in those rooms alone. We are all in there with them, cheering them on. And so when they stand up, when they speak out, when they express their thoughts and feelings, they should know that we're right there in the room with them. And we've got their back. I know Venus always has mine. I selected this excerpt because I felt that Vice President Harris described a sentiment that is held by many marginalized groups, especially women of color. Furthermore, Vice President Harris suggests that it is great to break barriers, but it is an even more worthwhile experience to help others achieve the same level of success. Good morning, my name is Minette Reed. I am the adult advisor for the Stafford County NAACP Youth Council. I would like to take the time this morning to thank Ms. Erin Creighton, the Adult Services Department Head, for giving the Youth Council the opportunity to participate in this program. We invited the adult members to join us, and we will therefore this morning be wrapping up with a reading from Mr. Richard Coleman. I hope you enjoyed the program and have a wonderful day. A Rage in Harlem is a Harlem detective series of novels written by Chester Hines. The novels are set in Harlem, New York during the 1960s and centering on various exploits that always lead to involvement of two black police detectives, Coffin Ed Johnson and Gravedigger Jones. The series includes Man with the Pistol, The Crazy Kill, The Real Cool Killers, Cotton Comes to Harlem, along with A Rage in Harlem. Cotton Comes to Harlem was adapted for a movie that included Red Fox as an elderly junk man and led to him being cast in the title role of the TV series, Stanford and Son. A Rage in Harlem was also adapted for a movie and I'm reading from the start of that novel. Hank counted the stack of money. It was a lot of money, 150 brand new $10 bills. He looked at Jackson through cold yellow eyes. You give me 15 C's, right? He wanted it straight. It was strictly business. He was a small dapper man with molded brown skin and thin straight hair. He looked like business. That's right, Jackson said, 1500 bucks it was strictly business with Jackson too. Jackson was a short, black, fat man with purple red gums and pearly white teeth made for laughing. But Jackson wasn't laughing. It was strictly business for Jackson too. Matter of fact, it was too serious a business for Jackson to be laughing. Jackson was only 28 years old, but it was a, such a serious business that he looked a good 10 years older. You want me to make 15 G's right? Hank kept after Jackson. That's right, Jackson said, 15,000 bucks. He tried to sound happy, but he was scared. Sweat was trickling from his short, kinky hair. His round black face was gleaming like an eight ball. My cut will be 10%, 15 G's, 15 C's, right? That's right. I pay you 1500 bucks for the deal. I take 5% for my end, Jody said. That's $750, okay? Jody was a working stiff. 
a medium-sized, root-colored, rough-skinned, muscular boy dressed in a leather jacket and GI pants. His long, thick hair was straightened on the ends and burnt red and nappy at the roots where it had grown out black. It hadn't been cut since New Year's Eve and it was already the middle of February. One look at Jody was enough to tell you that he was strictly a square. Okay, Jackson said, you get $750 for your end. It was Jody who had gotten Hank to make all this money for him. I get the rest, Isabel said. The others laughed. Isabel was Jackson's woman. She was a cushioned lip, hot body, banana skin chick with speckled brown eyes of a tease. Jackson was crazy about her, about as crazy as a, a moose for a doe. They were standing around the kitchen table. The window looked out on 142nd Street. Snow was falling on the ice pile, on the ice piled garbage stretching along like a levee along the gutter as far as the eye could see. Jackson and Isabel lived in a room down the hall. Their landlady was at work and the other roomers were absent. They had the place to themselves. Hank was going to turn Jackson's $150 bills into $150 bills. Jackson watched Hank roll each bill carefully into a sheet of chemical paper, stick the roll into a cardboard tube the shape of a firecracker and stack the tubes in the oven of the new gas stove. Jackson's eyes were red with, with suspicion. Are you sure you're, you're using the right paper? I ought to know it. I made it, Hank said. Hank was the only man in the world who possessed the chemically treated paper that was capable of raising the denomination of money. He had developed it himself. Nevertheless, Jackson watched Hank's every move. He even studied the back of Hank's head when Hank turned to put the money into the oven. Don't you be so worried, Daddy, Isabel said, putting her smooth yellow arm around Hank's shoulder, around Jackson's shoulder. You know he can't, it can't fail. You saw him do it before. Jackson had seen him do it before, true enough. Hank had given him a demonstration two days before. He had turned a, t a, a $10 bill into a $100 bill right before Jackson's eyes. Jackson had taken the $100 bill to the bank and he told the teller he won in shooting craps and had asked the teller if it was good. The teller had said that it was as good as if it had been made in the mint. Hank had had the $100 changed and given Jackson back his 10. Jackson knew that Hank could do it. But this time it was for keeps. That was all the money Jackson had in the world, all the money he'd saved in the five years he'd worked for Mr. Clay, the undertaker, and that hadn't come easy. He had drove the limousine for the funerals, brought in the dead in the pickup purse, cleaned the chapel, washed the bodies and swept out the embalming room, all the tr all the way to trash, full of can hands, cans full of bloody tr trim meat and rotten guts. All the money he could get Mr. Clay to advance him on his salary, all the money he could borrow from his friends, he pawned his good clothes, his gold watch, and his imitation diamond signet, and the gold signet ring he found in a dead man's pocket. Jackson didn't want anything to happen. I ain't worried, Jackson said. I'm just nervous, that's all. I don't want to get caught. Are we going to get caught, Daddy? We ain't got, ain't nobody got any idea of what we're doing here. Hank closed the oven door and lit the gas. Now I make you a rich man, Jackson. Thank the Lord, amen, Jack, amen, Jackson said, crossing himself. He wasn't a Catholic, he was a Baptist, a member of the First Church of Harlem, 
because he was a very religious young man. Whenever he was troubled, he crossed himself just to be on the safe side. Sit down, Daddy, Isabel said. Your knees are shaking. Jackson sat down at the table and stared at the stove. Isabel stood beside him, drew his head tight against her bosom. Hank consoled his watch. Jody stood to one side with his mouth open. Ain't it done yet, Jackson said. Just one more minute, Hank said. He moved to the sink to get a glass of water. Ain't the minute up yet, Jackson asked. At that moment, the stove exploded with such force that it blew the door off. Great balls of fire, Jackson yelled. He came up from his chair as if his seat of his pants had been, had been blown up. Look out, Daddy Isabel screamed and hugged Jackson so hard she threw him flat on his back. Hold it the name of in the law, hold it in the name of the law, a new voice shouted. A tall, slim, colored man with a cop scowl rushed into rushed, rushed into the kitchen and had a pistol in his right hand and a gold-plated badge in his left. I'm a U.S. Marshal, and I'll shoot anyone who moves. He looked like he meant it. There's a lot going on in that story, and I hope you enjoy reading them. The books are available online. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so give us one second here as I... Uh, add, I'm going to add Ingrid to the screen as well. So thank you guys all for joining us. Before we jump in and talk about like our um, favorite parts and things like that, I, I do want to read something that I forgot to read before we introduced that. Um, I just wanted to mention that on February 12th in 1909, a group of black and white citizens who were committed to the social justice founded the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The NAACP's main goal is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equity of minority groups in the United States and to achieve uh, equity, equality of rights and eliminate race prejudice among United citizens of the United States. In 1936, after young people challenged the organization to provide youth with a vehicle to address civil rights, the Youth, Council, the youth and College Division was created. Um, today, the NAACP Youth Council here in Stafford was our main partner, and I am incredibly grateful to Carolyn Reed, the NAACP Youth Council president, and to Minette Reed, her mother, who is the youth advisor to the group, for doing such a great job and for providing us with such a wonderful presentation. Um, I don't know what you ladies thought, but I loved it. <laughs> I did, yes. too. <laughs> I did, too. It was beautiful. It was great. Yeah, the part where um, Fatmata, and if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, I definitely apologize, but with the, when she was reading her first reading and she was talking about the um, the sharp green mangoes, that just really stood out to me for some reason. I just thought it was very visceral. It was like the, almost like you could taste those mangoes when she was doing her reading. It was just fantastic. Yeah. I actually related to her uh, for her second reading about uh, wearing her her clothing from home. And so I don't have cultural clothing from home, but, you know, I'm from Mexico. And so a lot of like foods uh, that we make, you know, makes me feel uh, connected to my family. My grandparents back uh, in Mexico makes me feel closer to them. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love learning about the cloth. I learned, um, I always forget the name of the cloth there, but I always think it's beautiful. Their garb is just beautiful. And I'm always like, oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. And so I loved her, you know, just, you know, kind of explaining to us um, a little bit more about, about it as well. Oh, and there were, uh, there were a couple people that read from one of my favorite poets, which is Maya Angelou. Oh, so yeah. I was really excited there to hear, to hear their interpretations. It was awesome. And how very passionate they all were about like yeah. connecting something like, you know, I think sometimes people think, you know, classic literature is out of date and out of touch. And some of it very much is. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to stand up here and say it is not. But um, mm -hmm. my Angela will never go out of style. She is just mm -hmm. an amazing, um, was an amazing author and just contributed so much, you know, literary works of genius. So mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. will be reading her centuries from now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and Andrea mentioned, um, she read from one of my favorite um, current authors. Um, I can't remember the author's name, uh, her, her, her full name, but her last name is Adichie. And she wrote the book Americanas, which is just one of my all-time favorites. And it was just, the whole thing was just fantastic. You know, Carolyn kicked it off with a beautiful reading and it just went 
it just was fantastic. So anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, we have another really fantastic presentation for you next. So uh, Ingrid, do you want to go ahead and uh, introduce that while I get the video ready to share? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. Uh, upcoming, we have Amanda Lynch. And Amanda Lynch is a registered yoga teacher who uses meditation and restorative yoga to help young people improve their mental health and to empower communities of color. She's also the author of the 2019 children's book, The Mindfulness Room, which is described as a lovely guide for stressed out kids and their caregivers. Today, we're happy to have Amanda lead us through a guided meditation. So let's follow along as she walks us through this transformative exercise. Enjoy. I think we could all use some of that right now. So oh, yes. <laughs> give us one second while we just share the screen, please. And thank you. Okay. All right. Oh, come on. It's always while you're waiting for it that it, there we go. Mindfulness teacher. I'm also a children's book author, and I'm very, very excited to be here with you this afternoon. I thought I would start by simply finding our breath, right? So what does that mean? We're just going to take just a moment to notice how we feel and where we are feeling this in our body. So if you're like me, I'm sitting at a desk and I tend to hunch over the longer I've been sitting here. I'm going to ask that you sit with a tall spine, really sitting up, bringing your shoulders back, chest forward. For those of you who may be sitting on the floor, maybe on a, a blanket, maybe even sitting in bed, I'd ask that you do the same. Maybe taking your shoes off, allowing your feet to root and ground against the floor. Softening your jaw and face. Lowering your tongue away from the roof of your mouth. I invite you to close your eyes if that is available to your practice today. However, if you would prefer to have your eyes open, that's fine. Simply find somewhere to fix your gaze. Maybe looking at the tip of your nose or at your feet. Maybe even on a spot on the wall across from you. And just notice the natural rhythm of your breath. Not straining or stressing. Just noticing your breath right where you are. As you begin to sink into practice this afternoon, begin to really fill up, to really breathe in deeply and to release fully. Maybe even counting to four on our inhale and releasing to four. Let's try that together. Breathe in one, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, inhale, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four. Try that for a few more rounds. Exhale, two, three, four. Really breathing in deeply. And as you sit with your breath, notice any areas in your body where you might be feeling tense or holding on to stress. Maybe rotating your head from side to side, rolling it around. Maybe rotating your shoulders front to back or opening and closing your hands. Take just a moment to stretch, to rotate your ankles and wiggle your toes, 
to loosen any spaces that might feel tight. Remembering to breathe. Breathe in deeply. Breathe out fully. Maybe even breathing in through your nose, but breathing out of your mouth. Slowly as if you are blowing out the flame of a candle. If your thoughts are beginning to wander, that's okay. Simply bring yourself back to the sound of my voice and back to your breath. When you are ready, begin to slowly blink, allowing just a little bit of light to enter before bringing yourself fully awake, fully present to this experience. Opening your eyes and taking one final deep cleansing breath. So our breath allows us to really create space in both our mind and our body, right? So in mindfulness, we talk a lot about the brain. We'll do the hand model of the brain in just a second. But I want you to remember three terms, right? The hippocampus, that's our memory box for our brain. Our prefrontal cortex. That's where things like executive functioning skills, problem solving, being organized, being able to make um, good and sound decisions. All of that comes from that front part of our brain, our prefrontal cortex. And then there's my friend, the amygdala, right? We have two amygdala. They're both um, almond shaped. They're right above our ears. That's sort of like our offensive line or our brain's quarterback, right? So our brain grows from bottom to top, starting at the brain stem. That's the only part of your brain that is fully formed when you're born. Your brain stem is really designed to control um, like life functions like breathing, right? Your heart beating, those kinds of things. The next piece of our brain that's formed is our amygdala. Our amygdala is like our fear or trauma response maybe even our survival response. There's lots of ways to define that. But what that does, it tells you that you're safe or you're in danger, right? So your brain, your amygdala, it's constantly scanning your environment, right? There could be a trigger that you don't even know about. Maybe the smell of perfume for someone who has caused you harm. Maybe you've been in a car accident and you didn't realize you were holding that experience in your body and you've slammed on brakes in the car. Your amygdala is on high alert. It's telling you to either freeze, to be ready to fight, or to run away, right? Sometimes our amygdala can be overactive and we're not able to pull from our prefrontal cortex. Remember again, our brains grow from bottom to top. Okay. One way to relax or calm that amygdala, our fight, flight, or fear response, is breath work and mindfulness, right? But we keep all of those mindfulness tools top of mind in that prefrontal cortex, okay? So you want to make sure that you are really doing these practices every day so that you can pull out one of those strategies when there's a real or even an imagined or perceived threat. I want you to close your eyes for just a second and I want you to imagine that you're on vacation. You make a left turn which turns out to be the wrong turn and there's a huge, I mean the hugest mud puddle, the largest you've ever seen and now you're stuck. 
ask yourself, what are you going to do? Right? Are you going to stay in the Jeep or the car? Are you going to cry? Are you going to try to get out and pull yourself or push yourself out? Are you going to call triple A? What tool are you going to pull from your prefrontal cortex, right? Or are you going to panic? Is your amygdala going to take over? Are you scared? Are you frozen or stuck? Now imagine that their Jeep is a negative experience or emotion, right? Mindfulness allows us to think clearly, to not act on impulse, and to pull out a tool to help keep us safe, okay? So instead of focusing on what's wrong, we can focus on what has happened and we're not stuck there, right? We can move into that next step. Sometimes I will ask my students, what is something that was negative that happened to you today? But not stopping there, what did you do about it, right? Did you get stuck? Did you freeze? Or did you pull out one of those tools to be able to free or heal yourself from that experience? So when we think about mindfulness, mindfulness simply means being able to focus your awareness and your attention right here in the present moment. So we're not thinking about things in the future or thinking about things that have happened in our past, we're focused right here. Our attention is all right here. We're not playing on our phone instead of paying attention to the person that we're eating dinner with. We're not continuing to do work on our laptop instead of watching our child practice gymnastics in the family room during this global pause. Our attention is very focused and very narrow and thinking only of what is right in front of you. One, um, I guess, uh, misconception about mindfulness is that it's just sitting in easy pose or crisscross applesauce and just meditating. And that couldn't be further from the truth. There are lots of ways to be mindful. I really enjoy mindfully walking, setting an intention to listen or look for birds or flowers, right? That's one mindful thing that I do because I go walking just about every day. You can mindfully wash your dishes. Focus your attention on the way that the water feels. What do the suds look like? So walking through that experience, focusing on your five senses, right? But you also want to be non-judgmental in this experience. You don't want to sit around and think, gosh, I'm not doing this right. You want to free yourself from all of those things. There's something called a neurological loop, right? Say that with me, neurological loop. It's sort of like playing a tape in your mind. Sometimes people even call it like having monkey mind, right? And so human beings, we have about one thought per second. But most of these thoughts are negative. 80% of them are negative. 90% of our thoughts are repetitive, 80% of those thoughts are negative. We tend to replay all that negativity, the things that people have told us, you're not good enough, you're not doing this right, you're not smart enough. We will replay that scenario. Over and over and over. Mindfulness allows us to reset that tape, right? To move away from being so focused on fear, guilt, and anxiety, and to simply be focused on the present moment and what is actually ha happening in front of you. So something stressful happened. Our amygdala, remember? Our security guard is activated, right? We're scanning the room. I'm stressed out. It could be something you don't even recognize as a stressor. Maybe someone has caused you harm and that person was wearing Chanel number five. So when someone else walks by with that perfume, your brain is already sensing danger, right? So a reactionary response to stress, you're ready to fight, you're frozen, or you're running away. 
right? However, by practicing mindfulness on a day-to-day -day basis, when our amygdala is activated, we're able to pause, take a deep breath, breath. scan the room, grounding ourselves, looking for something we can see, something we can touch, taste, feel. Right? We're able to pull a strategy out of that prefrontal cortex to be able to respond versus reacting, right? That's actually called um, like growing your neuroplasticity, right? Some things that you want to keep in mind. You want to be patient. Just like I'm not playing in the Super Bowl on Sunday because I don't play football. I've never played football. I've never practiced. Mindfulness takes practice. You're not going to just jump out the gate being able to meditate or to be mindful in every moment for hours on end, right? So set some realistic expectations for yourself. Be able to trust the experience. Inner work is not always pleasant, right? So you're being judgmental, but you're not, I'm sorry, you're being non-judgmental, but you're also moving through this experience, right? That might not always be pleasant. Some unpleasant things might come up for you. Let them go. Again, practice, practice, practice. The more you practice, the more you sit in stillness with yourself, the easier that experience becomes. So remember, our brains form downstairs, up. All of this happens through experience, right? So if when my um, automatic response is like crying as a baby, using the bathroom in my diaper, crying to be fed, if the relationships that I have with my caregivers are neglectful, I'm gonna be real bottom heavy here because I'm in a constant state of survival. So my amygdala is gonna be on fire. Versus if I have had loving, caring experiences, my needs have been met, it's much more likely that I'm able to pull from that prefrontal cortex, right? And that's with anybody. Our brains are not fully formed until we're 25 years old, right? So that neural loop, uh, that movie, that tape that constantly is playing, a lot of that is formed before we're 25 years old. So I'm gonna show you a quick breathwork activity and I really encourage you to try this on your own. It's called alternate nostril breathing. You're gonna make like a cowabunga hand. I'm not sure what this is really called, but I always call it cowabunga hand. You can tell I'm like an 80s, 90s kid. And you're gonna plug your right nostril and just breathe in through the left, right? Then you'll take your pinky and plug the left and breathe out through the right. If you have any upper respiratory stuff going on, you're going to want to get some tissues because this can get a little messy, right? So it looks like this, breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. And I would encourage you to try that for maybe two to three minutes. Sometimes I have to sneak in the bathroom when I wanna do this because I do have kids at home. And um, sometimes I just need a mindful moment. But really just sit with yourself. We did two breathwork activities today. One was just simply finding your breath. The other would be alternate nostril breathing. 
which you're alternating, right? And just give yourself grace as you move through this. Self-care and inner work is really hard work, right? It's sometimes hard to recreate or to let go of that negativity that might exist within that story that you're telling yourself. But let those things go. All right. So um, while I add our co-host back into the stream and remind them to unmute themselves, thank you, ladies, for muting yourselves during the presentation. Uh, I thought that, you know, that was a great presentation. And thank you again to Amanda Lynch, our um, local wellness author, who uh, agreed to record that, pre-record that and share it with us. Um, you know, especially where she's talking about uh, taking a moment, maybe sneaking into the bathroom to do it, like making it just, you know, that important a part of your day, like wherever you can need to find it. I just thought that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about it because, you know, I, I loved how she mentioned that a lot of times we think of these type of exercises as being something that's sort of time consuming and, you know, you're, you know, sitting there and, and you know, and so the, the idea that this is so practical and there are things that you can do to, you know, have a very short period of time there, but still be able to, um, to release some things in your mind and to be able to, you know, be more productive throughout throughout the day. I think that's an awesome um, message to bring home that, you know, you don't have to just wait until you have a large stretch of time in order to do these things. Oh, I totally agree. And I think especially when you, if you're getting thinking about starting with one of these practices, like I'm going to get started with mindfulness, I'm going to get started with meditation, you probably think I need like this huge amount of time and I need all this special equipment. But, you know, she's talking about just taking a minute to ground your feet, take off your shoes and be really present, which I was really impressed with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Um, I know that uh, there are a couple of, um, of websites and, um, and I think those are, I mean, I know there are some paid sites or whatever, but there's a couple of free ones uh, that, you know, there's an app. Um, uh, what's it? One of them is called Smiling Mind. Oh. And uh, so they have, um, it's completely free. I'll, I can put it in the, um, in the comment box if you like. Um, but it's smilingmind.com.au. AU. So I guess it, you know, originated in Australia, but they have an app, they have a podcast and a blog, and they do um, mindfulness exercises for children, adults, and educators. And it's completely free. It's, you know, so you're getting, you know, great content there and not having to oh, yeah. like a subscription for it, like with some of the other services. Is that something you use personally, Ingrid? Um, I actually use a different one, um, Insight Timer dot com it's um you know just insight timer you know um but they have a lot of you're going to see a lot of uh familiar faces on that one <laughs> um and i like it a lot they have uh they boast about uh 30, 000 guided sessions um they have an app on there um they have music tracks which you know uh i know a lot of I, i'm still working you know, Miss Lynch, I'm still working on it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I like to have a little, <laughs> I like to have a little music with mine. So, um, but there are also some uh, therapeutic pep talks, whatever. So, you know, sometimes you just need to, it, it may be something you already know, but sometimes you just need to be reminded. Um, and then there's also a section for children as well. There, So, nice. um, you I know, so I, I self-care, but kids definitely need self-care too. And if we can ingrain those practices yeah. in them when they they're young and they can learn how to deal with those stressful things in a better, healthier way. I mean, yeah. it, would, it would have saved me time today, but <laughs> uh, you know, I, I also liked in the video how she talked about um, taking mindful walks. Usually when I'm taking a walk, I'm, I'm thinking about exercise more than anything. And so I'm listening to music or I'm talking to a friend, but I think when I take my walk tomorrow, I'm going to try to take a mindful walk. What do you guys do for mindfulness in your own lives? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, so I uh, recently got introduced into aromatherapy, like actually doing it. So Ingrid was one. And then mm -hmm. my aunt also <laughs> sent us just a whole kit for it. So like we had to try it. And it, it it's really wonderful. It really uh, it smells great, makes you feel great. And mm -hmm. it, it makes like, 
your home just just more like relaxed and you know of all the stressful things that we're thinking about and going through it's just um a good reminder to do a little bit of self-care you know maybe a walk enjoy the fresh air and the sunshine oh definitely yeah yes now you all know that i love 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 my aromatherapy that check out the lunch and learn that she did back in december people it was really good <laughs> Yeah, I love sharing it with people because, you know, it's it's just so powerful. It was something that um, I got started because I was having a problem falling asleep and uh, just began to learn more and more about it. And uh, so that is really a, a big thing for me, um, you know, but I also noticed that uh, Ms. Lynch is a yoga instructor and i was like hmm now <laughs> um i know she's great you know um, i've only been to a few yoga classes but i can tell you that even though i you know really have a ways to go <laughs> with that um but it was a really great experience when um i left the first class and you know i felt like i was the only person there that wow really didn't know what was going on. It's like, okay, you know, by the time I get into this pose, they're all, you know, to the next one. And I'm like, yeah. okay. You know, you know what would have helped if you had done before if you had gone to the class, if you had gone out some of the library DVDs and books on yoga. Like, yeah. <laughs> I should have, you know. Next time. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I, no, I really needed it because everybody else knew what was happening next. And I was like busy catching up or whatever. But at the end of it, it was real. Um, um, I, I found myself, you know, very relaxed and everything. But like I said, you know, it's not something that... Um, you know, it, I'm I'm a super 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 uh, newbie with that. So, mm -hmm. um, but I enjoyed it so much and was able to relax a lot. And uh, I noticed there are some other websites um, out there too that uh, you know for people that are newer at it, but they you know would like to try. So I think oh, that's yeah. you know pretty cool. You know, definitely yoga is definitely one of those things. It's been around for centuries. And um, it really does help you relax in a different sort of way. So um, actually, you know, when we, we, we have, you know, when things are normal, we actually have all yoga classes at some of the libraries and things like that. And hopefully we'll get back to that one day. Yeah. Uh, but to get on to our next little presentation. So I'm just going to uh, introduce it and then I'll share my screen again. So we, next we have a presentation from the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Hare is going to present and he is the director for special projects for the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, um, also called the DHR. You'll hear him refer to that in the video. Um, the DHR is the State Historic Preservation Office for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, Jim has a very impressive background of taking with um, a BA in art history and classical architecture mm -hmm. and um, in historic preservation from Groucher College. Um, he is DHR's representative on the Virginia's African American Cultural Task Force, and he and his colleagues recently published a book um, called A Guidebook to Virginia's African American Historic Markers, which is now available through Uni you. University Press and from the library. And I will share the link um, to our Biblio Commons page um, once I share my screen. So please bear with me one second here. It's always the little awkward pause while you go to share a video. <laughs> <laughs> So the Virginia, um, Jim's going to mention this, but the Virginia Historic Marker um, Project is actually one of the one of the oldest, or actually the oldest in the entire country, um, which yeah. is really impressive. So, yeah. All right, here we go. Give it one second here. Oh, now it's telling me it's having trouble sharing. So let me try that one more time. Video. I've seen some of those historic markers around and they're just fantastic. They're, they're also really incredibly heavy. Um, I think they're, they're made of like iron or steel or some, one of those like very um, oh, wow. uh, industrious products. Cause they're meant to be around for a really long time. Um, mm -hmm. It also mentions in the video how, um, how ours have been around since um, basically they started having roads in Virginia. Special projects at the Virginia department of historic resources which is also known as DHR. 
I'd like to thank you for allowing me to be part of the National African American Read-In this year. I'm really happy to take a few minutes today to tell you about the guidebook to Virginia's African American historical markers and share some information about the past and the future of Virginia's marker program. In August of 1619, it's documented that 20 or more African men and women arrived on the ship White Lion at Port Point Comfort in present day Hampton, Virginia. To honor the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first Africans, DHR published the guidebook for the first time. This unique publication was long overdue. Shown here at a marker dedication for civil rights leader Dorothy Height is the chair of the Virginia Board of Historic Resources, Dr. Kalita Fairfax. In her preface to the guidebook, Dr. Fairfax said, and I quote, generations of Americans of African descent have contributed to the physical and the philosophical landscape of Virginia and the United States for 400 years, often at great personal peril, loss, and risk. The documentation of the events, sacrifices, and personalities that chronicle this trek is an intrinsic task for any society that seeks to recognize both the triumphant and its painful past. The guidebook is, therefore, a tribute to 400 years of contributions made by Black men, women, and children to the Commonwealth. And it's a compilation of the first 306 historic markers specific to their history, which is also America's history, to be erected in Virginia. The guidebook includes only official state historical markers that discuss subjects of particular significance, African American history. Markers about the Civil War, unquestionably a subject of importance to African Americans, are not included here unless they pertain to specific actions by Blacks. For example, the reader will find several markers pertinent to the activities of U.S. colored troops during the conflict. Markers for the many properties and historic plantations that would not have succeeded were it not for the enforced labor of African Americans have intentionally been excluded from the book. This is despite the fact for the last 30 years, it's been a policy of the program to make mandatory marker texts an acknowledgement of the contribution enslaved people made to their operation. So part, the markers in the guidebook <clears throat> are based on criteria that included the individual and collective achievements by Black Virginians since 1619 to establish independence, secure civil rights, combat injustice, acquire positions of leadership, rise to the highest rank ranks of professional regard, or as in the case with even very modest achievements that white Americans take for granted, to accomplish even basic measures like the establishment of a troop of Girl Scouts, which is why that topic was selected as the cover for the book. As a result, the guidebook has an index of nearly a thousand entries, something that I feel makes it very valuable for anyone who is researching African American history in Virginia. I guess the easiest way to describe the editorial mission of the guidebook is to say it's to show how Blacks have surmounted the many barriers put in the way to keep them from enjoying it's enshrined in the Declaration of Independence, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And as I've noted, the guidebook is long overdue because the program of which these markers are a part began nearly a century ago, in 1927, at a time when roads suitable for motorists in Virginia were often in pretty bad shape. But as these photos show of the same location, photographed a few years apart, were quickly being improved to handle the early automobiles. The Virginia Department of Transportation, which partners with HR to administer the marker program, began to track roads by the system shown on this early map of letter codes and numbers. And that organizational system, an artifact of the early 20th century, is still oddly alive and well. The letter usually refers to a specific road, for example, E was given to US Route 1, markers north of uh, Richmond, and the number identifies the marker as part of a specific series. 
markers are, not, are now assigned a, a letter code that matches the primary code used in the jurisdiction where a sign is erected. Each new marker is given the next number in the series. We also have a GPS based tracking system nowadays. So this old system is a bit quaint to say the least. Let's just say old habits die hard and historians are often slow to embrace change. And so Virginia's roads and the marker program both have come a long way. Virginia's inventory of historical markers now totals well over 2,600. Nevertheless, while our agency is very proud of the publication and of the guidebook, excuse me, proud of the publication of the guidebook, we're also quite sobered by the fact that it took 92 years to get here. During those nine decades, guidebooks about the marker inventory were frequently published. And in fact, they were and still are a very popular part of the program. And by the way, I forgot to mention that our marker program is the oldest in the nation. Virginia was the first state to choose to showcase its history by erecting distinctive metal markers along its roads. Within these early guidebooks, however, the reader was hard pressed to find a marker specific to African American history. In fact, of the first 700 markers erected, only three discussed African Americans in any detail. One was about Nat Turner's slave revolt. One was about the quote, faithful slaves who saved their white owners during the revolt. And the third marker was about Central State Hospital, which it noted was, quote, the first hospital in America exclusively for the treatment of mental disease in the Negro. Judging by the early results, we can be fairly certain that the men who created the program in the 1920s, segregationist Governor Harry Flood Byrd and State Conservation Commission Chairman William Carson, had primarily a white audience in mind as the program's target. They were also just as much concerned about business as they were about history. They and the program's first manager, Hamilton James Eckenrode, envisioned tourists visiting areas both urban and rural, where they would contribute to the local economy by stopping to eat, gassing up at the filling station, and perhaps spending the night at one of the newfangled motels springing up around the Commonwealth. What a swell idea. No doubt the booming advertising, fast food, and historic attractions industries were also eager to get on board. Participation in this endeavor, however, required not only access to a car, but also confidence that travel in unfamiliar places would be safe and convenient. And so, while the open road beckoned to white motorists with promises of freedom and adventure, African Americans had good reasons to find automobile tourism much less enticing. Segregation, prejudice, and racism meant black travelers were often denied services at roadside businesses or were served at them on a humiliating and unequal basis. Such conditions in Virginia, and let's face it, throughout America, eventually gave rise to privately published travel guides, such as the one shown here, the Negro Motorist Green Book, which informed African Americans about the public accommodations that would welcome their business. Fortunately, much has changed since then. Progress to represent the full diversity and breadth of Virginia's history in the African, excuse me, in the market program has also been made, especially in the last 20 years. This is also reflected in the other history programs at DHR, which we administer for the citizens of the Commonwealth, not least of which are the Virginia Landmarks Register and the National Register of Historic Places. We are very aware, however, that there's still an enormous amount of work to do. This is true when it comes to documenting the efforts by African Americans to demand fair treatment and their civil rights, but it's also true about marking the advancement African Americans have made to all facets of American art, science, religion, and culture. 306 markers were featured in the guidebook when it first went to press in late 2019. Included are markers for key events such as Danville's Bloody Monday, the Supreme Court ruling in Loving versus Virginia, 
the bravery and dedication of Virginia's Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. The brilliant black mathematicians made famous by the movie Hidden Figures, Katherine Jackson, Dorothy Johnson Vaughn, and Mary Winston Jackson. It also includes culturally significant people, such as 1930s and 40s race film producer, Oscar Michaud. Along with markers for a long list of black artists, jockeys, opera stars, race car drivers, sports heroes, and other entertainers born in Virginia, such as those shown here, Ella Fitzgerald, Pearl Bailey, Ruth Brown, and Tommy Edwards. Nevertheless, there are still some who challenge our efforts. In 1986, for example, when the marker for the Robert Moton High School was erected, a letter was sent to DHR complaining that, quote, a Negro high school wasn't of serious historical importance. In fact, not only was Moton High School at the center of the legal battles that resulted in the Brown versus the Board of Education ruling by the Supreme Court, which ended segregation in public education in the United States. It was also where a 16 year old student, Barbara Johns, led the walkout that ignited the fight. By the way, if you haven't heard, Barbara Johns will soon replace Robert E. Lee as the second of Virginia's two contributions to the Statuary Hall collection in the Capitol in Washington, DC. Virginia's other statue is of President George Washington. Since we published the guidebook, there are now 52 more African-American historical markers that have been researched and written by a marker program staff and approved by the Board of Historic Resources. You might say it's time for a second edition. That said, we still have a great deal of work to do to correct the imbalance of markers pertaining to other underrepresented groups and topics. There are now just 61 markers about Virginia Indians which is far too few for this foundational topic in Virginia and American history. There are also just over 129 markers about women's history. As for LGBTQ history, there are none, but we soon may be able to erect a marker for uh, William Billy Haynes in Stanton, his hometown, which would be very nice since his career in the silent movies took off just as the highway marker program was be being launched in 1927, and he became one of Hollywood's top five box office stars between 1928 and 1932. In closing, I'd like to share this statement by the marker program's terrifically dedicated manager and senior historian, Dr. Jennifer Lukes, and I quote, Highway markers are visible to a very large audience, including many people who might not have any other occasion to read about Virginia's history. Our signs bear the state seal and they convey a sense of authority. It's therefore crucial that the diverse, complex, and at times poignant story of Virginia's past be reflected on the markers that dot our landscape. That is my goal for the program as we push forward into the 21st century. I think Jennifer's goal is the perfect goal to have for the program and for the guidebook, and I hope you agree. So thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please let me know. My email, jim.hare at dhr.virginia.gov, is shown on the screen right now. Thank you, and have a great day. Okay. So that was um, Jim Hare with the Department of Historic Resources. I'm just going to add my co-hosts back to the presentation. Um, you know what I liked about that presentation? I liked a lot of things, but I liked two things specifically. One, um, they're very upfront about how much work, much, much, much more work they need to do with recognizing the very diverse past that Virginia has. And I really like that because, you know, as somebody who sees diverse people, works with diverse people, and, you know, really wants to help support them. It's really nice to be able to look around at your state and see. Um, two, I did not know that Ella Fitzgerald was from Virginia until I watched this presentation. And I love Ella Fitzgerald. She has a really famous quote, um, it isn't where you came from, it's where you're going that counts. And I think this, that quote kind of applies to hopefully our future as a country and definitely the future of that program. So, yeah.
I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I know. It's, it's really incredible to see them, you know, going back and making sure that uh, all these organizations and people all, also get, you know, recognized. And th there is definitely a lot of work yet that they have to do. So good luck. Good luck to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate all that they are um, working, you know, and striving to do. Um, to recognize, you know, because there is such uh, a vast history, you know, within this state. I, I feel like I'm always learning something new um, all the time, <laughs> you know, basically. So definitely. And and it's nice. That, like I said, it's really nice that they acknowledge that, like, you know, nobody's perfect. We're very aware that he he basically says this book should have been around sooner. We're making a huge effort now. We're committed to this. And not just for the, you know, the uh, promoting the historic contributions of our Black citizens, but of our women citizens, of our Native American citizens, of our, you know, LGBTQIA citizens. Like, this is, that to me felt very positive. Like, you know, we're going to keep moving forward. We're going to keep making sure that we recognize the contributions that everybody makes to make this, you know, such a great place to live. And, and hopefully, um, you know, we can all work together towards that. So... Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So, Joanna, do you want to, to mention that? something else too, real quick? Because yeah. he pointed out the the Green Book. Um, yeah. So I saw the copy of that. So if anyone that has not seen it, we do have it in the collection. It is so worth your <laughs> time. I, I love that too. The movie you're talking about, the movie, the Green yeah. Book, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness, it was awesome. Awesome. Definitely check it out. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I, I remember when that got, when it was like nominated for an Oscar. It was a very good movie, but I had no idea. Actually, that was another thing I learned from this program that they named the movie Green Book after um, after the, the guy. Oh, cool like, thing. Probably mentioned that in the movie and I just like didn't pay attention to that one part. But I really liked that, you know, the Green Book was based on that. And yeah, I thought that was cool. So, yeah. right. so yeah. Joanna, do you want to introduce our next video while I try to load it up on my hint? Yeah, so our next video is from Little Black Notes, and it's a unique learning and performance-based music instruction program, primarily designed for children and adults in group settings. Uh, as the founder and director of Little Black Notes, uh, Sheva Porter, uh, Shiva Porter is particularly committed to developing innovative and creative ideas to change and improve our community uh, through music collaborating, uh, with schools, churches, assisted living, senior centers, and centers for children and adults with disabilities. Uh, she works diligently to find creative and innovative approaches to keep the children and the community actively engaged and exposed to the world of music. Uh, her music co competences have resulted from more than 25 plus years of experience as a practicing expert in music education, classroom instruction, directing, flute and recorder profici proficiency with a specialized teaching discipline in piano theory and technique. Uh, so her music studio is open for both in-person and online classes. Uh, lastly, her students have put together a wonderful performance for this program today called the movement of music. Yeah, so I'm gonna click open and hopefully it just works this time for us. And I hope you enjoy.
So that was the um, let me just add my coworkers, my co-hosts back into the stream. Um, hang on one second here. Thank you guys so much. So that was our presentation. Um, that was our final, uh, that was the wonderful music presentation by Little Black Note Studio wraps up our whole african-american reading for this year um i hope you guys had as much fun as i did what, what did you guys think do you think it was pretty good oh, it was amazing yes. it was beautiful was good? <laughs> i liked it honestly it was like it feels like a whole even though we had to do this virtually this year and you know that was a huge pivot for us i feel like we all came together as a community to put something together really really kind of special so huge shout out huge thank you to our community partner um, our big community partner the stafford naacp youth council um, for all the work that they did for it this year and special thanks to all of our extra presenters um, amanda lynch and her um, wonderful guided meditation jim Hare from the department of uh, virginia historic resources and finally to little black note studio and shiva porter thank you guys so much i hope you guys enjoyed it as much as i did um, come to the library, borrow any of the books that you'd like to, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.